What's a dangerous con man? My this fucking dude, Wim mm-hmm. Hof. James, guest, happy. How are you? Wonderful. Good. Yeah, thriving. Ready for learning more about park enemas. Very happy to hear that, James. I, you know, speaking of enemas, what? Do, why? Why do? What is it about enemas? Why are? Why are some people fucking obsessed? With this is like the key to all health. <laughs> it does seem to have a captivating power over the human spirit, yeah. doesn't it? The enema. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a kind of person, enema guys and enema girls, who are just like obsessed with fucking enemas is the answer to all health problems. Yeah. It's, uh, it, I don't know. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's a laughing thread throughout human history. Someone should do a PhD on it. Yeah. I think it may have something to, to do with the fact that it's like an intense experience that, <laughs> I uh, imagine. Yeah, creates like powerful physical sensations and some people just flip out over it. I don't know. Yeah, I know. And it, it becomes seems cleansing. central to their life. Yeah. Yeah, in a way that it, it, it's not if you uh, inject park water into your colon. Yeah, you, you gotta like, I don't know. Like there are like, obviously sometimes enemas are a useful tool for healthcare people yeah. to, to yeah. give sometimes yeah. people need enemas but it should never be like a regular part of your day-to-day right no you should i think you just like down giving yourself enemas for fun yes yeah yeah under yeah. medical supervision only i think is my mm-hmm. stance on enemas yeah but yeah, look at us enema cops both of us yeah enema cops uh yeah. that's that's my job i'm gonna make sure people's assholes are nice and dry Mm-hmm. I've broken yeah. with the anarchist over this and I'll be mm-hmm. uh, becoming yeah. one of those really annoying Stalinists on Twitter. You're a, an asshole authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Well, you know who's not an asshole authoritarian is Wim Hof. Uh, really? He thinks, you know, if you live in a, a state with public health care, you should just cut your guts to ribbons <laughs> yeah. with a sprinkler head. <laughs> and, you know, your fellow citizens can pay for that because you're a drifter who abandoned your family for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> That's what socialism does to a to, to mm-hmm. a motherfucker. It, uh, yeah, yeah. Every time, and Un- yeah, can't not do it. it happens now, everywhere. So James, when we left Wim, he had just shattered his guts by taking a public enema from a water fountain to avoid acknowledging <laughs> that he'd abandoned his family. <laughs> that said, he does eventually come back to the picture. His book, The Way of the Ice Man, gives us very little detail on the. Long gap between Olea's suicide and his rise to prominence. Uh, right after Wim, later Rip Wim remarried and had another son, we just get this line. The children grew up and Hoff looked for more challenges. <laughs> yeah, they grew up more or less without you, buddy. Yeah, he looked for challenges that did not include parenting, I guess. Yeah, not a challenge he was that interested in. So God. at this point, his story jumps ahead to the mid-aughts. There are not any particularly good or objective sources about the reality of his life in this period. So we're going to have to rely on some bad ones. I found an article with irishnews.com that features heavily an interview with Laura Hoff. Now, today, Laura is involved in her father's business in her fire. So not an unbiased source without a financial interest in, in how Wim is seen. Um, and her interview does not in, acknowledge some of the unpleasant stories that Scott talks about. But I think her claims about what it was like being raised by Wim are still worthy of analysis because at the very least, if, it, this, if this is not accurate to reality, it does show how the, his kids who are affiliated with his business think it is advantageous for their father to be seen, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. If this is not an accurate recitation of reality. And we do not objectively know what happened with women as kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Quote, on a cold winter's day in Amsterdam many years ago, while other parents were wrapped up warm to collect their kids from school, Laura Hoff recalls her dad turning up in a t-shirt, shorts, and sandals, and then doing a bit of yoga in the schoolyard. I think I was raised by a very special man, which I only understood later, says Laura, 36, agreeing that the childhood that she shared with her three siblings was absolutely different than that of her friends. We always used to play outside. If it was cold, it didn't really matter. The weatherman never dictated what we needed to wear. Now, that could be also 
go with Wims basically abandoning them to a squat. Uh, the fact that like <laughs> yeah. he, no one was there to make sure they yeah. were dressed properly. Also, we for didn't the cold. have any clothes. <laughs> yeah. Also, we didn't have any clothes. <laughs> Laura gives us little detail on what Wims' life was like after Olea's suicide and his eventual return to his family, which she, of course, has no obligation to do. But yeah. it does mean that this next period of his life is a bit of a black box when it comes to hard facts. This is as much as she says about being raised by Wim. We were very free. I don't think there were any rules. Sometimes you would think, okay, kids need some rules, but it was also the best time in my life. My father used to play more than we did, so we al- he always wanted to go outside with us, and that was great. So, I don't know. That's another version of the story. Uh, believe <laughs> yeah, what you want. Rather juxtaposed. Yeah. So, Wim claims that after his wife's suicide and returned to his return to his family, he traveled around the world doing what a normal person would call extreme stunts, summarized in his autobiography this way. His breathing techniques, yoga, and cold training gave him enormous strength, and he liked to share it with others. The media got him in their sights. Encouraged by the attention and the effect it had on other people, Wim broke record after record. He took the longest path in ice. He climbed snow-covered mountain peaks wearing shorts. He ran a marathon in Lapland at negative 30 degrees Celsius. He swam hundreds of meters under ice. His records were reported on television in Japan, Germany, Poland, Spain, and many other countries. The BBC made a documentary about him, and millions of people watched his feet on the internet. And again, the way he's talking about his early activities is almost as if they like the the fame that he received, the media coverage was an accident, right? The media right. got him in their sights as opposed to he was kind of a fame hound and he deliberately went out of his way to get covered by the media. Yeah, he actively pursued being in the media at, at any opportunity. Yeah, it was like, oh, he just wound up getting famous somehow. Real (laughs) crap, shoot. (laughs) There's some dude over there climbing mountains in boxer shorts. Maybe we should do a story. Yeah. Now, all of these records, the 26 Guinness World Records that he claims to have set, are in reality somewhat less than accurate. And we'll cover that shortly. But for right now, I want to return to another one of Wim's claims. Uh, He says frequently that after years of groundbreaking athletic success, he grew frustrated. Quote, possibly because he was still coming to terms with Olea's suicide. Quote from his book, he felt the need to share his knowledge and the possibilities of his body with more people. Could other people do what he can do? In 2007, the renowned Feinstein Institute in New York studied Hoff. The results showed that he was able to control his autonomic nervous system. For Wim, the results were logical. After all, he had trained to do it for many years, but the researchers thought he was a medical wonder. From then on, Hoff put himself at the disposal of science. His main aim was to show others that they could also train to do what he does. It was the start of a very special time in Wim's life. He attracted more and more attention, and those who started using his method were wildly enthusiastic. Now, James, I'm going to admit to a potential failure as a researcher here. I have definitely found evidence of the Feinstein Center and Dr. Tracy, who runs it, commenting in articles that feature Wim Hof. They seem to be connected. I have not come across any publication from the Feinstein Center about Wim from 2007. But 2007 is the year that he claims to have run the world's fastest half marathon while barefoot on ice or snow uh, in two hours and 16 minutes. Yeah. Okay. How much competition is there for that, uh, for that title? <laughs> it, I don't think there's a lot. Uh, yeah. I don't think Was there's there a, a lot. previous record? First, it is important you remember the qualifier here is this is the fastest half marathon barefoot on ice or snow, right? Not the mm-hmm. fastest half marathon, not even the fast ha- fastest half marathon barefoot. Now, this is his only legitimate Guinness World Record. He did do this. This was verified by Guinness. He does hold this record. I do want to note here that Wim's time, if you are not using the qualifier that it's the fastest half marathon barefoot on ice or snow, is not particularly historic, right, as a yeah. half marathon time. Yeah. The current fastest half marathon is 59 minutes and 47 seconds, which <laughs> is insane for 13.1 yeah. miles. <laughs> and it wouldn't be record-breaking as a marathon time. Yeah, it, no, I mean, it would be good. It'd be, be very impressive. Yeah, two hours is a great marathon. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, to two and a quarter hours, it, it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's less than fast people are yeah. running for fast marathons. So. so the first hard evidence of scientific analysis of Wim's claims that I have is from 2011. 
Wim had by this point turned his experiments in cold weather endurance into a lifestyle. He was well known for going on long barefoot runs in the snow and submerging himself in ice for long periods of time without shivering. A 2011 article published by Radboud University's Medical Center is the first example I found of him being tested by a reputable scientific source. It is notable that this early article describes him as the Iceman Wim Hof. Radboud's researchers were specifically testing Wim's claims that he could influence his autonomic nervous system and immune response through concentration and meditation. And in that, they are talking about what people now call Wim Hof breathing, that is a a version of G. Tummo breathing. And I'm going to quote from this study here. To investigate this, Hoff was administered endotoxin while practicing his concentration and meditation technique. During this experiment, various measurements were performed, including brain activity, autonomic nervous system activity, and inflammatory mediators in the blood. One of the researchers said, After endotoxin administration, the increase of the stress hormone cortisol in Hoff was much more pronounced compared to other healthy volunteers. We know that this hormone is released in response to increased autonomic nervous system activity and that it suppresses the immune response. In accordance, the levels of inflammatory mediators in Hoff's blood were much lower. On average, Hoff's immune response was decreased by 50% compared to other healthy volunteers. In addition, hardly any flu-like symptoms were observed. These results are definitely remarkable. So that makes it sound like Hoff was able to basically control his immune system to reduce his immune response to being mildly poisoned in a way that reduced his symptoms, which is very impressive sounding, right? Right. If that's a thing he was able to do, that is that is impressive. That's interesting. But the paper went on to caution. Those results were only obtained from a single person and thus could not serve as evidence for claims that Hoff's techniques could influence the immune system in meaningful ways. Sure, he could just have a weird response. Like, Yeah, we, we will refer, there's follow-ups to this study, so we will okay. talk about that in a little bit. The year before that 2011 study, 2010, Hoff and his eldest son, Inam, had set up a company called Inner Fire to capitalize on the growing fascination with Wim and his claims of superhuman abilities granted through breathing techniques. They started organizing workshops, first in the Netherlands, but then all over the world. Several other of his children joined the organization, which grew rapidly as Wim became a bona fide celebrity. Now, if you don't recall, the period from 2010 to 2013 was the birth of commodified viral content online. Journalists and writers for culture websites like my old employer, Crack.com, had a voracious appetite for so weird it must be true stories, and Wim Hof was perfectly situated to go viral in this area. The number one reason for his success was his embrace of mainstream scientific studies of his techniques. Hoff could do this because G. Tummo breathing, which is the basis of all of his claims, does work in measurable ways. In 2012, researchers from Radboud performed that follow-up study, comparing volunteers trained by Hoff and a control group. Testes were poisoned, lightly, and the immune activation of the different groups was studied. An analysis of various studies on Wim Hof breathing by the medical journal journal Temperature notes, The trained group had significantly increased epinephrine levels, increased levels of anti-inflammatory cytokine, decreased levels of pro-inflammatory mediators, and less pronounced fever. Also, flu-like symptoms were low were in the trained group compared with the untrained group. And you will find this cited constantly on Wim's website and in news articles about Wim. Usually the study results are summed up as the people who Wim trained were able to control their immune systems and avoid sickness. That is not what happened. And that journal article continues. The setup of the research, however, did not allow discrimination between the acute and the acquired responses because during the experiment itself, the volunteers from the intervention group were allowed to hyperventilate and the control group was not. Therefore, the investigators included that hyperventilation can temporarily activate the sympathetic nervous system and suppress the innate immune response. Long term. Yeah. Yeah. Long-term training effects were not addressed. Therefore, it still needs to be sorted out if the training itself, hyperventilation, cold, and or meditation, caused the observed effects. This study also notes that the trainees were not just given cyclic hyperventilation training. They were immersed in ice-cold water, while the control group was not. This matters more than you might think. Quote, Finally, 
Cold may exert health effects. First of all, cold may increase energy expenditure by shivering, but also by non-shivering thermogenesis, as mentioned above. In the recent past, quite a few studies from several laboratories showed that humans are able to increase their non-shivering thermogenesis capacity due to cold acclimation. This mirrors numerous studies in rodents. However, the study effects in humans are of a smaller magnitude compared with these animals. So number one, it's very debatable. There's no evidence that there's significant health benefit to this. These people had mildly less symptoms than the control group, right, of this mild poisoning in a yeah. controlled situation. And number two, there are too many variables that we're not yeah. isolated for that you can't say, oh, it was because of the breathing or the meditation. Or it may have just been, yeah, there's health benefits to being immersed in cold water, like potentially, right. at least or short term ones. That, that body was freaking out because it yes. thought it was drowning. Yes, it, you can't say the kinds of things that are claimed. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was, like, for people who were on the internet back then, like, yeah. that was the whole genre of, like, health viral influencer, right? Was taking a, a solid scientific claim and then building gradually less and less solid claims on top of that and 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 then grifting off that and telling people you can make them happy and healthy and yeah. save their lives and such. Yeah. So, anyway... That gives you an idea, and you can find other studies about WIM. They all have breakdowns like that when you actually get into what is being studied. Anyway, we will talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, so that's 2012 that that follow-up study is conducted by Rad Bowd, and it is the very next year that our ethically questionable friend Scott Carney comes onto the scene. 2013 is the year that he met Wim Hof, well, he, and he's he's working on this book called The Enlightenment Trap, and he thinks Wim might be an interesting subject for it. He kind of wants to expose him as a grifter. So he talks Playboy magazine into letting him go, like, hang out and take one of, one of Hoff's classes. So, yeah. And he, he specifically writes in his more recent article that he wanted to, quote, debunk him as a charlatan trying to sell fake superpowers to the masses. Uh, which is, I think, a reasonable way to describe Wim Hof. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he started out just fine. So, Carney describes Wim in 2013 as, quote, at most, most a circus act. <laughs> he wore a green <laughs> hat and had a red nose and ruddy skin that made him appear a little gnomish. He was bursting with energy, talked loudly, and smelled like an onion. To the <laughs> extent that he was known at all, it was for performing death-defying stunts in ice water and for a stint-shilling battery-heated jackets for Columbia sportswear, not for <laughs> possessing valuable insights on the mind-body connection. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, real. Uh, I, I, yeah, I didn't know you how he went You get a feeling they had that. a fallout. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought something happened here. Mm -hmm. It is interesting because like he describes him in this period as like, yeah, he was like a big media figure in this part of Europe, uh, but he was kind of like, you know, a little bit of a carny, you know, someone who would, yeah. you, would, you would shill these gimmick jackets. Yeah, he's like a Joe Exotic of, of like uh, of doing this yeah. stuff, you know, like yeah. he, he's famous, but not necessarily respected, I guess. Yeah, uh, I would I would say that. So so Scott gets to work studying Wim and listening to his classes, and he finds himself, as he says, flabbergasted by the fact that Wim's techniques really do work. There's powerful benefits to this stuff. That's how Scott describes it. Quote, Within a few days, I learned to hold my breath for several minutes at a stretch and heat my body in the snow. An autoimmune illness that had plagued me for 30 years went away. A few years later, I climbed shirtless up Mount Kilimanjaro with Hoff when the temperature dipped into minus 30 degrees. There was no doubt about it. I was a convert. Soon I became his chief evangelist, not only writing the book What Doesn't Kill Us, which spent a few months on the New York Times bestseller list, but also appearing for more than 300 media engagements, from TV shows and news articles to radio programs and podcasts, where I preached the good news news that's so weird like i don't know man i've written about some people i admire and i've written about some people i hate but i've never like done 300 podcast interviews about how great anyone is like it, it he kind of seems to have moved from journalism to to part of this hoff grift at this point yeah so it's at this point that we should probably talk about mount kilimanjaro james because okay. Kilimanjaro is central to Wim's claims of supernatural ability. It, it features heavily in all of his stories. Um, and I'm going to quote first from his how his conquest of that infamous mountain is described by Rolling Stone article Eric Hedegaard in a 2017 article. 
He attempted to scale Mount Everest wearing nothing but shorts and shoes, but was thwarted by a foot injury. He, atta- he tackled Mount Kilimanjaro next, wearing only shorts and shoes, and reached the top in less than two days. An unheard of feat. So, <laughs> James. Yeah, that's not a- <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he has given us some stuff to dig into here. So the yeah. first question we should ask ourselves, is it an unheard of feat to, to reach <laughs> no. Kilimanjaro and the top of Kilimanjaro in less than two days, right? Is that exceptionally rare? No. The current world record, and this is fucking nuts, by the way, <laughs> the current world record for an individual climb and descent of Kilimanjaro is six hours and 42 minutes. <laughs> that is boss. <laughs> that is fucking nuts. Yeah, that is yeah. some mountain running. That is fucking yeah. impressive. That is wild. I, I don't I actually don't know how that's physically possible, but it apparently has been. Yeah, the altitude change. Like I haven't been I've been up the other two highest mountains in Africa, uh, yeah. high Atlas and uh mount kenya but yeah uh, i've never done higher than 14k for a peak and like that is a thing you know Mm -hmm. like fucking and this is like so by the way carl egloff of switzerland is the guy who did that obviously he'd be a swiss dude not surprised yeah yeah. Um, i I had it down for being like someone from like tanzania or kenya or somewhere I mean, and, and it is like uh, when we are talking about Kilimanjaro, the peak of Kilimanjaro is 19,000 feet above sea level. Uh, yeah. It is 16,000 feet above its base plateau. That's the topographical prominence, which is a, a commonly used measure for the difficulty of climbing a mountain. Basically, it's like because you have a lot of peaks that might be like 16,000 feet. Maybe they're only like a 2000 foot hike or whatever above right. kind of the ridge or whatever. So, yeah, Kilimanjaro has the fourth highest topographical prominence of any peak on Earth, uh, which makes it, you know, by any widely accepted mountaineering metric, one of the harder mountains out there to climb. So, hey, Wim is bullshitting about his time up to the top of Kilimanjaro being particularly exceptional. But hiking to the top of Kilimanjaro in shorts and shoes does seem impressive. Um, And it's certainly not a bad time. But he generally fails to note that he didn't actually summit Kilimanjaro. He didn't actually <laughs> reach the he didn't reach the top summit of Kilimanjaro. And I'm going to quote here from a write up by Pepijan von Erp, a mathematician from Radboud University, which is the same school that carried out the experiments that initially seemed to verify Hoff's incredible claims. Quote. Wim Hof and the group of pioneers started on January 14th at an altitude of 1,800 meters. From there, they marched on to a camp at 3,700 meters. They stayed there during the night and went early in the morning to break through the top at 5,685 meters, Gilman's Point. This tempo would normally not have been possible because of the acclimatization time used to prevent altitude sickness. But wait a second, Gilman's Point, that's not the actual summit of Kilimanjaro, is it, Wim Hof? And it is, in fact, one of three official summit points on the mountain, but not the actual peak, which is Uhuru Peak, um, which is where the dude who made the trek in less than seven hours reached and then made it back (laughs) down. So again, you can get some insight into the nature of of Wim's personal sort of like uh, PR tactics here, right? Any normal person would consider reaching Gilman's Peak with a group of largely untrained hikers and getting back down in two days or less to be impressive. And doing it in shorts, extra impressive. But that's not going to go viral, right? Because you're not breaking any records, you know? You're doing a pretty good time and a pretty impressive thing, but you're not doing anything that's like going to win you an award. And so you've got to kind of jink the truth in order to get something that's going to be real easy yeah. to like go viral in an article or whatever. And like choosing Kilimanjaro is a choice, right? Like it's a big ass mountain and it's a great sure. achievement to climb yeah. it, but it's not a technical climb. No, it, 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 it's, you know, like it, it's, it's something you could like, people do Kilimanjaro in their retirement. If that's the kind of thing yeah. they enjoy and you could spend a lot of money yeah. and have someone carry all your stuff. Like yeah. for something that sounds super impressive, like it, it's not Everest, and it, yeah. he, he compares them in the same paragraph in that piece you read a second yeah. ago. So like it yeah, it's very I don't know. He's taken like one point of truth and extrapolated. Exactly, exactly. And the way that he phrases things, he's always got a defense if people call him out. Because if someone's like, Well, but you didn't actually do it this way, he can always be like, Well, no, what I meant is that no one else hiked up at this time without a shirt or or wearing shorts or with an untrained group of hikers, right? So it's the shortest time for someone doing all those things because, like, no one keeps track of that shit. Yeah. 
It's like if I were to climb up Kilimanjaro in like five days and be like, yeah, but I did it the fastest anyone's ever done it in a head full of cocaine. I was like, well, <laughs> nobody's really keeping track of that, <laughs> yeah, you know? <laughs> fastest guy named Robert Evans who yeah. was doing coke at the yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. I beat that other Robert Evans. He didn't even yeah. make it up to Kilimanjaro when he was on <laughs> cocaine. That guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't do cocaine, folks. Just just good old fashioned gas station Adderall. You know, that's the that's the healthy thing to do. Is that the stuff that's by when when you check out? It's called I, like I rhino. Get those giant trucker pills, and I yeah. mix them with kratom. We call that a Seven Eleven oh, speedball, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll suppress some parts of your body's natural responses when you do that. Let me tell you, you sure will. Way better yeah. than Wim can. We're gonna line you up with some Dutch scientists, buddy. This could be a whole thing. Yeah. So it's when you read Wim's book that it becomes clear he wants his followers to believe no one else can manage the hike in the time that he did. Quote, Hoff decided he would climb Mount Kilimanjaro with a group of people. Kilimanjaro is a 5,895 meter, 3.66 mile high mountain in Tanzania. It's a very popular expedition for mountaineers and hikers. Well-trained climbers can get to the top in six days. To make the challenge even greater, Hoff wanted to climb Kilimanjaro in 48 hours with a group of 26 people. Hoff wanted to show that we're all capable of doing much more than most people think is even possible. With this expedition too, everyone said it was impossible to get up to the top in 48 hours with such a large group. As if that wasn't enough, some of the people in the group were suffering from diseases like multiple sclerosis, rheumatism, Crohn's disease, and cancer. They also had no climbing experience. The date was set for January 2014, and the run-up to the expedition was chaotic. Dr. Geert Bougies of the Amsterdam Medical Center wanted to accompany the expedition in a personal capacity to help the group. The local guides thought the whole thing was a bad idea. At the last moment, the guides decided not to go. However, Hopp was resolute that this group was capable of reaching the top by focusing on their breathing and because they had prepared with cold training, so they went. <laughs> when the group arrived at Harombo Hut, a small huddle of climbing huts at an altitude of 3,705 meters, the temperature had fallen to 3 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. As of climbing to the top of Kilimanjaro in 48 hours with 26 people, many of whom were ill was not enough, Wim suggested they walk bare-chested and in shorts. Breathing and cold training were the secrets. And again... If that is the way that it actually went, that's impressive enough. But again, it's Wim's, dumb. Wim's, it's dumb, though, but Wim's got a lot. And it's not like superhuman. Again, he's lying about like it's almost well, tra- only well-trained climbers can get to the top in less than six days. No, man, people are up and down that thing. Someone has done it in less than seven hours, yeah. which is not to say like everyone can do that. Obviously, that's an extreme thing. But like six days is it's not it doesn't it's not like impossible to do in less than six days. Yeah. You don't have and to you're be like a world doing class the altitude athlete. acclimation, right? Yeah. Like like when you're doing that six, seven, ten day trip, yeah. whatever you're doing, like you you're you're taking time to acclimate to different yeah. altitudes. But yeah. It it I know like I have a I don't know why this one upsets me so much. I think having done some some walking up mountains, mm-hmm. like if your guide says, nah, fuck it, I'm not going, that's dumb, you like don't go. Because that same guide is going to be on a search and rescue team finding your dumb ass and like risking their life to try and, and help you. And that that's not OK. Yeah, he's being really reckless here. And I've I've been reckless doing a mountain climb before that was ill advised, but not with 26 people I was responsible <laughs> yeah. for, you know, like, again, yeah. it's about like who you endanger and like, yeah, and I I shouldn't have done the the climb that i did but it was a it's it, it yeah it's like this too. yeah it's it, it, it's this claiming that like what you're doing is somehow like impossible no one thought we could do it it's like no man like people have done much more impressive yeah. things on kilimanjaro than what you did rooting it not in like oh i'm just a grifter or i just wanted to see yeah. if i could do it even or i wanted to do something yeah. hard but being like oh i did it for everyone so yeah. everyone could see what they're capable of like uh it, it no you didn't yeah, I'm glad no one died this time, but that may be evidence of the fact that like Kilimanjaro is a mountain that you can get away with that on as yeah. opposed to Everest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Someone would die or like K2 or whatever. Oh, ab. Yeah. So yeah. Send, send him up K2. That's a challenge yeah. we're throwing yeah, down for Wim Hof. Yeah. He's shirtless. Yeah. Yeah. You think you're hard. Mm-hmm. From 2000, actually, you know, first off, James, you know who is hard? Uh, people who buy the products uh-huh. from these, yeah, because we've yeah. got dick pills. That's right. We do have dick pills, God willing, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. God Inshallah, willing, we'll we get will more dick you. pills. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, so Hopefully. Yeah, grab some dick pills, grab some trucker amphetamines, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, grab Bottle some of gas whiskey. station crate and mix them all together. See what happens. Yeah, you and know? run up about That's how that yeah. guy did it in six hours, man. Yeah. 
You know how you know how weightlifters talk about muscle confusion? Confuse all of your organs. You know what? Just take every pill in the gas station and see what it does to you. That's the key yeah, to good health. You'll set some world records for sure. <laughs> you sure will. <laughs> Highest heart rate by you. <laughs> So from 2014 on, Wim's fame picked up by leaps and bounds. Inner Fire became a popular lifestyle wellness brand for celebrities interested in pushing the extremes of human capacity. Harrison Ford bragged about taking his classes on a live talk show appearance. And he was far from the, a lot of celebrities are into Wim Hof breathing, have done his stuff. Wim was a regular guest on the Tim Ferriss show. That's one of the big things that made him huge. Tim Ferriss is the the four-hour work week and the four-hour body. He does all of these like, hacking like body hacking and productivity right. hacking yeah is he the bulletproof coffee guy no 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 that's okay. a different guy that's it but i think that guy's been on tim ferris's show okay yeah and it, one of the claims that wim made on tim's show was that he could speak 10 languages fluently <laughs> which is an impress i've known yeah. some people who are that kind of polyglot i've had some fixers who were that kind of polyglot yeah you know? victor victor boot famous yeah. uh multiple language guy yeah. My uh, my uh, my Arabic teacher like learned Mandarin over the course of a year as like a, a side hobby, like the way some people yeah. get into like basketball or something yeah, casually. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah he just like picked up a fluency. <laughs> yeah, because he's a language genius. You know, some people right. are like that. So that's an enviable skill. It is a very. Are. It's the most enviable skill, in my opinion. But um, and I can't say that Wim can't do this. Um, I don't know if Wim can speak ten languages fluently. I do know that Wim stretches the truth about a lot and he's yeah. probably stretching the truth about this but because tim ferris is also one fan describes him as a language hacker he <laughs> asks wim how did you learn 10 languages and wim answers just be open and love to learn and that's it i had no real teachers you know people in the street and sometimes i had to look for a teacher like a japanese teacher here in amsterdam and a hindu teacher so yeah i was just interested if you are interested in life and you get to know and you never stop learning because you love it <laughs> I don't think he speaks English fluently. Yeah, like that's 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 not a coherent statement. Yeah, I think he meant Hindi and not yes. Hindu. I was wondering what was going on there. Yeah. So anyway, but that's understandable, right? If he's like, if he's not, his language English isn't yeah. perfect. Maybe he would mess that up. So yeah. appearances with Joe Rogan and other extreme sports affiliated media personalities followed, and Wim's portfolio of braggadocio expanded too. Kilimanjaro was always one of his chief claims to fame, but he soon added the claim that he had broken 26 world records. This is again untrue. He currently holds one Guinness world record for that half marathon, but it is easily Wim's most boring lie because there's not even a fun story here. He's just full of shit. But papers, including well, like that's because he hasn't done an enema in a while, buddy. Yeah, he's, yeah he needs <laughs> he's to get an enema. Get the shit out. That'll clean the truth up here. Yeah. But like a lot, I found like Rolling Stone and Guardian articles, all sorts of articles that will just repeat the 26 world records thing. Yeah. Sometimes they hedge their bets, being like he claims to have won this but rarely do they actually dig into the fact that, like no we didn't he just didn't <laughs> yeah, yeah. he just He's didn't just do lying. this yeah <laughs> now Many major outlets have often been willing to lend credence to Wim's claims. By far the greatest ally he's had as a grifter are the podcasts of guys like Joe Rogan. Probably my favorite example of this is quite mild by comparison, but I found it funny. In one talk with Rogan, he was making his usual bold claims of having gained control of his immune system. And yeah. Joe asked, you're able to deal with malaria? And Wim responded, yeah. yes, he was. And further, he would be willing to get infected with malaria for science <laughs> to prove his resilience. And all I got to say is... Yeah. Please, let's do this. Yeah, let's give him a shot podcast full of malaria. Bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah do, it, in the do it as a cave. bit, Wim. <laughs> yeah. Get the number one killer of human beings across the, the aeons of time that we've existed oh. and infect yourself as a bit. <laughs> Jesus Christ. As someone who's had... You do not want to do that as a bit or not. That yeah. will... It's like, again, it's like you. fucking with, uh, like, with Mount Everest. Like, you just don't want to do that, right? Yeah. You can fuck around with like, you know, when they're doing these studies, they'll inject them with a little bit of poison, right? To induce yeah, basically gonna a mild him. flu. You don't fuck around with malaria. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't even Rogan fuck around with malaria from? pills. Like with the medicine that you take to avoid no. getting it has pretty serious side effects. Yes, it does. That stuff is, I have seen some sunburns. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Where, where did Rogan plug that one from? The guy's like, oh yeah, I can control my immune system. He's just like, yeah, you want to do malaria? 
Let's you go. want to yeah. take some malaria <laughs> yeah. with me? So, uh, God, the, the good that would do to the world if we it, could get it, both it of those be. men it, to, yeah. to a malaria challenge. Yeah. Both get them to take it. Nah, man, if you really want to, DMT is pussy shit. If you really want to, like, learn some stuff about yourself, bro, you got to take malaria, Holmes. <laughs> like, that's how you fucking learn you're tough. Uh, you don't like my Joe Rogan? Uh, I no, really, anyway. I really fucking hated that. It's and it, good. And, it was, good and the listeners don't get the the horrifying visual of you of that coming from your mm-hmm. face. It's just yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Ruining I'm a good me. thing. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, you've ruined malaria, Robert. <laughs> yeah. How dare you? Jesus. Malaria is gonna get canceled now. Yeah, Chuck and Gunya is right there, wanting to take its spot the whole time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was gonna go with the that sleeping sickness. Me. Yeah. Didn't so like that. Much of Wim's success with shoddy journalists and podcast hosts lies in the low level of scientific literacy in this country and his skill at pulling out techno babble that would make a Star Trek writer blush. One of Wim's favorite claims is that his hyperventilation techniques allow someone to reach levels of oxygen saturation above 100% in their blood. <laughs> Now, James, oh, no. oh. <laughs> neither of us are doctors here, but can you pick out where the the scientific irregularity might be there? Yeah, yeah I think it's uh, it's right around in the notion. The notion of percentages is a thing. I, yeah. I think I think in this next section, we should have James read read the part of whim. You're right. You're right, James. We're going to read a, a transcript from that October 2016 interview on the Joe Rogan podcast where he makes this claim and Joe questions him. I'm going to be Joe Rogan. OK. Oh, I love that for you. OK. And and you'll, you'll be whim. All right. So Sophie's going to Sophie's going to send Am this I going to do my Dutch accent. Yeah, no, do your Dutch. Do no. Your, no, be real yeah, yeah. offensive with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll do it's, my offensive Joe Rogan accent. Yeah, I'll just say, what is it now? It's called from a chimney, yeah? Mm-hmm. People who don't understand mm-hmm. the uh, Dutch tradition of Schwarte Piet will uh, not understand that joke. Here we go. Here's me as Joe Rogan. But there is nothing more than 100%. They had a level that they thought was 100%, and then they said nobody had reached a higher level than this, so it must be what 100% saturation looks like. Yeah, exactly. It's not that you got more than 100% saturation. It's that you achieved higher levels of saturation than they thought possible. Yeah, exactly. They did it with a laser on the chest, and then they were able to measure the mitochondrial oxygen tension. They are able to receive more oxygen. That's a great finding. It shows we can have more oxygen inside. Suddenly, we were able to get into the cell and influence the energy production. If it is anaerobic, it is like two molecules able to produce. When it becomes aerobic, then it's 38 molecules they can produce. <laughs> what happens? What happens with a cell that is deprived for 48 hours of 35% less oxygen? It becomes cancerous. As simple as that. <laughs> Have you ever worked with cancer patients? I want to, but it's very complicated. <laughs> Thank God for that. Now look, I gotta tell you, none of that means yeah. anything. That's bullshit. Yeah, those are not, some fucking like, words. That is not science. They have talked to medical experts. They have talked to doctors. Uh, fucking Scott Carney had to try to get this like translated. It's nonsense. Those are two people using words that that they think mean something that don't mean what they think they mean, but they yeah. they've properly learned how to pronounce them and are just using them in ways that don't actually make well, sense. And, and yeah, it's princess it's just, briding is what the, we call yes, it. Yes, it's inconceivable and nonsensical. Uh, well, Joe and, and Joe is even a little worse there because he recognizes as soon as Wim makes his first set of claims that they've achieved. He says, like, we had oxygen saturation of 103 percent. Joe knows that's impossible. So he's like, you meant this, right? And then Wim, yeah. like, just goes off on a limb using techno babble that, like, again, does not is not accurate. This is not what is happening. Yeah. This is not what happens with people who do his breathing techniques. But, no, but yeah, it's not it, a thing. It, it does show kind of the degree of, um, I would say, like collusion that Rogan has to try to protect his guests. Yeah, he's trying to insert a narrative being like, no, we have to make this credible. Like, yeah, steer yeah. in this direction. Yeah. And but Hoff is, is resolutely sticking to his absolute bullshit. <laughs> his fucking <laughs> nonsense. Yeah. Absolutely not being made credible. Refusing now, to 
Wim's dedication to this bullshit has caused consternation to some of the honest researchers who studied his techniques for years because they were impressed with some of the benefits that those techniques might have had. Scott Carney quotes Brian McKenzie, a breathwork expert who worked with Wim for years before being turned off by his pseudoscientific claims. McKenzie says that in his opinion, no person at Inner Fire has a meaningful grasp of the physiology behind their techniques. Wouter van Marken Lichtenbelt, a professor of health at Maastricht University who has studied Hoff, terms his scientific vocabulary galimatius, a rare word for nonsense. Quote, he mixes in a nonsensical way scientific terms as irrefutable evidence. That's literally what I just said. Okay. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Wooter mm-hmm. just uses a fancier yeah. word. Yeah, so if he's been silenced That's by Wooter. That's literally what I just said. I'm a professor of absolutely nothing. You're welcome. That's right. That's right. Now, <laughs> Wooter wrote that article in the Journal of Temperature that I quoted from earlier, and he has explained scientifically how some of Wim's most apparently impressive accomplishments are less than what they seem. A good example is his famous ability to remain submerged in ice water for significant periods of time without shivering. Wooter notes that upon exiting the ice, he does shiver like anyone else, and that while he has adapted to the cold to a degree most of us would find impressive, many other people have shown shim- shown similar capacity without following his methods. Quote, The conclusion must be that nothing miraculous occurred. Although a non-shivering thermogenesis of 40% is considered as high, it is not that extreme. I think Wim Hof withstands the cold and the ice cubes through a combination of several factors. An increased heat production, non-shivering thermogenesis, brown fat activation, contraction respiratory muscles, efficiently increasing body tissue insulation, vasoconstriction, thereby reducing heat loss and conserving the body core heat content. And finally, perhaps not unimportantly, he used his well-trained mental ability to endure the cold change of mindset, as he calls it. As soon as he steps out of the ice, he starts shivering just as everyone else, due to the redistribution of the cooled blood from his limbs to the body core, also known as the afterdrop effect. Now, one of the things we will note is that there is evidence in some of these studies that the people who train with Wim show benefits beyond those normally associated with G-Tummo breathing. Those benefits, though, are in line with the fact that he is very good at motivating people. He is a good teacher in his ability to make people excited and feel both comfortable and safe and good about themselves so that they will explore pushing the limits of their bodies beyond what they might normally do. And that is, to the extent that there's anything extra going on with Wim's training, it's that he's really good at making people feel comfortable experimenting and taking risks they might not otherwise take. And on the, the level of that where it doesn't go badly, it has a pretty profound impact on people, right? When you are convinced to try something you didn't think you can do that is difficult and uncomfortable and a little scary, and then you succeed, you feel great. Yeah, right? it's super empowering. It's very empowering. When you do it with a group of people, you can become very close to those people, right? And mm-hmm. if there's someone who leads you through it, like that person can become a guru, right? It can engender an almost religious mania. This is why a lot of, we talk about like all these different kind of cults and stuff that have, they'll get people in a group and have them like yelling and in, insulting and attacking each other, or they'll all focus on like abusing one person, which is a lot less healthy than kind of the way Wim does it. But the goal is the same, right? To have an intense, extreme experience that pushes people beyond some limit they had set for themselves. And that can cause them to have a degree of like almost religious faith in the person who led them through it, right? Right. Um, it's guru syndrome, you know? Yeah, yeah. You see it in all kinds of things. Like, and it's why it can be so empowering. Like, it's why we run, like, outward bound programs for people with yeah. disabilities or people with injuries. Like, I've worked on some of those. And it, it's one of the coolest things to do if, if you yeah. stop before you turn into a total piece of shit. Yeah. And that's the problem with Wim, right? Because, you know, a lot of aspects of what he's doing are certainly healthier than, I don't know, the kinds of like training that some of these like weird uh, drug abuse cults and stuff would do where they'd have everyone shouting at each other in a circle. Sure, a lot less toxic than that. But there is an alleged body count to the way Hoff's training works. (laughs) Before we get to that, we are are building to that. There are a couple of other lies I want to bust of his first. One involves the claim, sometimes made, that he summited or at least got close to summiting Mount Everest in shorts. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. 
yeah, you'll hear that sometimes. He aborted his attempt at Ever up Everest slightly past base camp because he got frostbite. Because again, <laughs> he tried to do the shit he's done other places. You can't fuck around with Everest. It's Mount no, Everest. It kills you. It kills people all the time. It doesn't give a fuck. The other is his claim that he holds the world record for longest swim underneath an ice flow without breathing equipment. Here is a segment of his response to a 2022 Guardian interview that gives you an idea of how that one tends to sound. There was a moment swimming under the ice when I found myself. I lost my way because my corneas froze underwater. I had no goggles on, just shorts, holding my breath. I was under a meter-thick layer of ice in Finland, lost and blind, but I never felt like I was drowning. No panic or pain. I felt at peace and in control. That experience brought me so much. In the end, a safety diver brought me back by pulling me by the ankles to the exit hole, which I'd passed long ago. I did a huge gasp for air when I came up. In that moment, I conquered the fear of death. Now I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid not to live. Fuck me. Of course, first off, he didn't need to do that. Second, like every other fantastic claim Wim makes, his recollections here do not jive with the record. And it's here that I'm going to return to Scott Carney's Mia Culpa write-up. All was not as it seemed that day. In the 2011 book, Becoming the Iceman, Hoff wrote that he almost died on his first attempt under the ice. On that try, he ignored his own safety protocols and tried to sprint twice the planned distance without telling anyone on the crew. Afterwards, Hoff claims his eyes froze under the water and he lost his way, and that he was lucky a rescue diver found him after he blacked out and brought him to the surface. Oh, wow. His brother yeah. Marcel, who was standing on the ice above him that day, remembers it differently. He took it too far and blacked out, Marcel says. He recalls Hoff performing his staple breathing exercise of his method, deliberately hyperventilating, just before his underwater swim. According to Marcel, it's just as likely that Hoff experienced shallow water blackout as his failure was to frozen eyeballs. There's no reason it couldn't have been both. Yeah, that's, I mean, if, like, I don't know if if this is a spoiler, but, like, hyperventilating will cause you to have shallow water blackout and so yes. will sprinting underwater. Yeah, which is why you shouldn't do it. Yeah, absolutely do not do this shit. Yeah, be, again, the water, a lot like Mount Everest, deserves yeah. your respect. Yeah, 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 We're yeah, not yeah, supposed we'll, we'll to be there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we are particularly not supposed to be underneath ice sheets. It's very alien to us. You must be extremely careful. <laughs> Yeah, I've watched Avatar 2, Way of the Water, and uh, I understand that I understand a lot more now. But uh, yeah, you you are not welcome. In, well, the water is a lovely place, and people should go underneath it. But like, don't be pushing your limits and hyperventilating. I like, take yeah. a course from someone careful, who's actually qualified. Take training. Go with a group. Have yes. rescue equipment available. Lots of safe ways to be in the water. Yeah, lots like of if ways to mitigate buddy. risk. You know, in the water. Yeah. Yes, if he hadn't had not just a buddy, a whole team of people with significant equipment, like a diver in gear underneath ready, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he still very nearly died. Yeah, this is why people, I don't know if he took a rope, but like people traditionally freediving for records, like rope dive down. Yeah. And then they have safety divers at every height to accompany them in case they black out. But Because it's so dangerous. Twice the fucking distance. I don't know whether he did that or not. Like, yeah, you you will die. Yeah. (laughs) So this and numerous videos of him enduring ice water baths, spending time fully submerged in ice water, all that kind of shit, this is all critical to the Wim Hof legend and also the deadliest part of it. And to introduce this segment, I'm going to quote from an article by Outside Online. August 10th, 2022, a Southern California lawyer named Rafael Metzger was at, home, uh, was at his home in Long Beach with his 17-year-old daughter, Madeline Rose Metzger. After a busy afternoon of phone calls and work, Rafael left his home office to start dinner. He searched the house for Madeline, eventually walking to the backyard to see if she was taking a dip in the family's swimming pool. He saw her laying face down in the water, motionless. Rafael attempted CPR, but to no avail. Paramedics later arrived at the house and also tried to resuscitate her, but she was gone. Two days after the accident, a medical examiner from the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office told Rafael that Madeline had died of accidental drowning. Her toxicology tests were clean, they said, and there was no sign of physical abnormality, like a heart arrhythmia. Madeline put on her bathing suit, went to the pool to cool off and to reduce anxiety following an argument with Tammy Metzger, and she did Wim Hof breathing, the suit states. She became hypoxic and thereupon drowned in the shallow water, despite being an excellent swimmer. 
The lawsuit from the Metzger family accuses Tammy and Hoff of negligence in Madeline's death. It also levies charges of fraudulent concealment, unfair business practices, and false advertisement against Hoff and inner fire. Defendants were either aware of or culpably indifferent to unnecessary risks of injury. Raphael Metzger is seeking $67 million in damages and also asking courts to require Hoff to post warnings on his website and promotional materials that the method is dangerous and should never be done in water due to the risk of drowning and death. We were shocked to hear that such a young girl drowned, Inham Hoff told Outside, shocked by the allegations, which don't make any sense to us. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kill you. It, it, yeah. It's somewhat remarkable that I know he has a body count. I guess it's very hard to tell how many people have died hyperventilating in water, right? Like, yeah. People yeah, it died is... swimming and freediving often. Yeah. It, and it's hard to know the exact potential body count. I think there are something like 14 or 15 people alleged in lawsuits against Hoff's organization currently. Uh, you'll hear numbers between like 12 and 15. Yeah. We're going to read one more story. But first, you know what never gets anyone killed, James? I don't think we can safely say that. Well. Because it's a, it's a the dick pills again because they, they've, they've got a body count. I mean, look. Can you call it living if you don't have dick pills? And that's a good question. You know, you got to, uh, sometimes it's better to have lived the days that you did have. Rather yeah, than, uh, yeah. Which is why, again, go to the nearest truck stop, buy every pill they have, and just mix them with like some Everclear and some, 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 uh, some high C, you know? See what happens. See, yeah. You'll, you'll learn a lesson about yourself. Or someone else will. Yes, yeah, so, someone will learn a lesson, one hopes. <laughs> yeah. Lessons Maybe will not. be learned. <laughs> yeah. You'll contribute to humanity's knowledge. Here's ads. We're back. So I'm going to read one other story of an alleged Wim Hof training victim. And this is from a Scott Carney's article. On Labor Day in 2019, Andrew Encinas, a 27-year-old social media entrepreneur, shuttled back and forth between his new office to set up his desk with a fleet of new computer monitors uh, and the party at his brother's house in Anaheim Hills, California. Like his business idol, Gary Vaynerchuk, Encinas thrived on the challenge of starting a new business and constantly looked for ways to optimize his performance. His favorite technique for dealing with stress was a breathwork and ice immersion protocol called the Wim Hof Method. Around 6.30 in the evening, Encinas made his last trip back from the office his brother Adam invited him in for ice cream and a football game on TV. Sure, he said, but first I want to do my Wim Hof in the pool. He asked to borrow a pair of swim trunks. This wasn't unusual. Over the years, Encinas had learned that the Wim Hof method had an almost miraculous calming effect on his nervous system. He watched videos of Hof swimming under Arctic sea ice and teaching influential social media stars to hyperventilate to the point of passing out. Encinas preferred to practice alone and often did four or five rounds of breathing in a single day. Video of Andrew doing the breath work in the water a few months earlier focused on the peaceful expression on his face. He texted his friends that the method works really well in the cold. A few minutes after Andrew went in the pool, Adam started to wonder when he would finish up and rejoin the family. Then, according to the coroner's port report filled in Los Angeles County, children at the party noticed Andrew appeared to be sleeping in the shallow end of the pool. Adam ran outside to find his brother in a meditative position underwater, with his hands clasped in front of his chest and unresponsive. Adam dragged Andrew out of the water and performed CPR to get his heart beating again. But when we got to the hospital, there was no brain activity. He was already a goner, says Adam Encinas. So... Don't do this stuff. Yeah, yeah. do not do folks. This. Be very careful. Um, don't do it anywhere near water. If you're going to experience with like these tummo breathing techniques, do them nowhere near water. Yeah, and put a lot of time in between doing them and getting in the water. Yeah, yeah. Don't even yeah. do them. Uh, like if you if you scuba dive, right? Like you shouldn't yeah. be doing any of this within no. a couple of days of scuba diving. No, care. Take care. Yeah. So Wim does warn on his site and in videos, these two techniques, the breathing and the cold water immersion, which make up the majority of his teachings, should never be combined. But he also shows off video of himself <laughs> submerged in water or swimming constantly. And both water and G-Tummo breathing are key components of his shtick. This is a big part of why reputable scientists and quasi-reputable reporters like Scott have backed away. I don't have a lot of respect for Carney after the role he played granting credibility to Hoff, but I will note that his article on the man is about as complete a, uh, a yeah. rebuttal of him as you are going to find. And it does a good job of showing how Hoff's claims that inner fire warns students away from mixing techniques together do not hold, well, water. And I'm going to quote from that article again. 
Hoff's website and YouTube videos do in fact include prominent warnings against performing the breathing method in water. One typical example, a YouTube video that gives Hoff's basic breathing instructions and has 66 million views, includes this warning in its description. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Don't do the breathing exercises in a swimming pool before going underwater, beneath the shower, or piloting any vehicle. Always <laughs> practice sitting or lying down in a safe environment. And Ham Hoff, Wim Hof's son and the CEO of Interfire, is adamant over email. Wim Hof doesn't teach hyperventilation techniques. Within the Wim Hof method, we never teach people to do our specific breathing exercises before submerging in water. We are very careful and protective in teaching people the Wim Hof method so they practice in a safe environment. Now, even in places where warnings uh, exist, Hoff simultaneously teaches a veritable recipe for blacking out in water. In numerous instances, he conflates water work and breath work and abandons safety protocols that he explicitly states are necessary. According to a Wim Hof method instructor, the training center that Inner Fire operates in Poland lacks even basic safety gear like AEDs in case someone's heart stops during his intensive workshops. The disconnect between what the Hoff organization says in its official capacity and the actual teachings Hoff gives can be jarring. Take, for instance, the eighth week of his $99 class 10-week video course. After almost two months of training in breathwork and cold exposure, which work up from very mild practices to ever more intense variations, Wim Hof stands in front of an icy waterfall alongside an eager shirtless student and gives some simple instructions. Go into the water, he says in the video. Keep go on with the breathing. Keep on being focused. Then you sit. Then you immersed. Focused. And you stay in the water. Hoff gives similar sets of instructions various ways three times over the course of the lesson, ultimately hyperventilating in his own characteristic way and then dunking his own head under the water and staying for about a minute. A strange disclaimer in the comment section next to the video appears to contradict what Hoff is doing on screen. It reads, The guy in the video was guided by Wim to learn to deal with the cold. He's not doing the breathing retention and then putting his head under the water. <laughs> At the very least, the juxtaposition between the written warning and Hoff's own words is confusing. At worst, it's a dramatic acknowledgement of the sort of negligence that could get someone killed and that's the wim hoff story james <laughs> magnificent yeah wonderful stuff yeah don't be doing this yeah uh yeah good times man it's just so like i get i it, it's such a, it's a sad like condemnation of this whole industry right like here's a guy yeah. who will teach you how to breathe mm -hmm. uh, and and people have paid for that and, and sadly people have died uh, yeah like it does, yeah. it is very calming. I like to free dive. Um, mm -hmm. It is the <laughs> closest. Yeah, I, I just do a bit of Wim Hofing and then off I go. Um, mm -hmm. But no. it's the closest human beings can ever get to flying, I think. But no, I do not Wim Hof. It is bad. If, it's like a joke. It's a standing joke. If you go free diving with someone new for the first mm -hmm. time, yeah. you like go out there and you start going. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. watch the dude look at you like, uh, like what <laughs> have I got myself in for? You know. So. James, I wanted to end by reading a couple little things I found in this listicle about Wim Hof facts. Oh, Because there's some fun ones in here. Yeah, I so, can't wait. Number one is the claim that Wim learned to control his heart rate in university. Uh, quote, and it wasn't <laughs> even part of his curriculum. <laughs> Here's, yeah, an okay. Here's a quote from this very reputable article, James. When the Reddit user Futbucker2424 <laughs> asked Wim when he learned <laughs> asked Wim when he learned to control his heart rate, Wim replied, in university, by measurement. Can you picture it when most students were desperately trying to make their way through an economics textbook or recover from a grueling hangover? Wim was spending his days learning to control his heart rate. Futbucker. Very impressive. Fut, <laughs> futbucker or but, uh, futbucker. Yeah, futbucker. Yeah, futbucker. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Number 13 is <laughs> Wim doesn't need psychedelics because he can trigger his own DMT gland. <laughs> oh, the DMT gland. <laughs> <laughs> in Wim's AMA, he was asked, Hi, Wim, do you or have you ever used any kind of drug to find deeper consciousness in order to control your autonomic nerve system? His response, no, not at all. I can trigger my own DMT, a hormone driven from the pineal <laughs> gland. I know how to get there and can do that all the time. You have better control over the hormonal system. You don't need drugs to be drugged out by yourself in a natural way. <gasps> Fuck me. Wim. Oh. I will take DMT with you, and I guarantee it yeah. will fuck you up in a way that you cannot fuck yourself up. I will promise you that, my friend. <laughs> Where do you think the DMT comes from, bro? But they got to harvest it from the gland. That's right. That's how I get it. Uh, yeah, from the gland of a giraffe. Kill a Dutchman. Yeah. Oh, you, you kill, get a giraffe. I'll, I'll, giraffe. Still, I'll kill a Dutchman instead. <laughs> yeah. Much yeah. more ethical than a giraffe. There's yeah, plenty yeah. of Dutchmen. They, yep, they're not a, not a rare species. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. No shortage. 
hand yeah. harvested DMT from the, the D stands for Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, the M stands for man. I don't know what the uh, yeah, I don't know what the T stands for. But. Yeah. Um, I do. I hate the article author of that stupid article, John Brooks. I do want to read you his bio. Uh, oh, even though it's a little bit of an aside. John Brooks is a stoicism teacher and crucially <laughs> practitioner. His stoic meditations have accumulated thousands of listens and he has created his own stoic training program for modern day stoics. <laughs> well, it's one of the things about stoicism is they really thrive on how many people download their podcast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very stoic. Nothing more stoic than noting your thousands of listens. Yeah, <laughs> you're getting that ad revenue. God, God, I've never seen stoic used more in a sentence. Three times. Yeah, well, you got to get the SEO up. Mm-hmm. It's another big <laughs> element of stoicism. It's, it's one of those it's things SEO. like stoicism. You want to read like ancient Greek stoics. Perfectly fine. People who talk about being stoics, 100% of the time, very frustrating human yes. beings. Yeah, yeah. This is like yeah. people who talk about reading infinite jest. Yes, Walk away. yes. Yeah. Or people leave. who like call themselves utilitarians. Like, oh, oh you're, yeah. yeah, that's a bell end. Someone yeah. says that to you. That is you a trick. You are not talking about the actual attempt to determine the greatest good for the greatest number of people. You are trying to justify change cheating on your girlfriend like, <laughs> that is yeah. that is what's going on in this yes. story yeah mm-hmm. and hopefully someone plays football with your head too as they did to yeah. Jamie Bentham yeah anyway James anything to plug <laughs> well after that buddy I, not holding your breath underwater uh, yeah don't no. hold your breath under water don't hyperventilate, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, you can hold your breath underwater sometimes if you do it the right way. It takes some do classes. Sensible. Yeah, there's a yeah. FINA. Uh, FINA offers one. Uh, mm-hmm. Paddy offers one. Uh, mm-hmm. FFI offer one. Free diving Great. classes. You can mm-hmm. take them. Yeah. What else do I have to plug? Yes, uh, I have a book already, and you can find it by going to the library and saying, this dude, James Stout, has written a book. It's called The Popular Front of 1936 mm-hmm. Popular Olympics, and, and mm-hmm. they will order it for you, and you won't have to pay. Mm-hmm. And yeah, on It Could Happen Here, you can hear in a few weeks, I will do a podcast which involves me talking about holding my breath underwater in, in a non-fatal way. Uh, yeah. And going to the Marshall Islands to do it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. you can find me when I uh, eventually have my fist fight with Wim Hof. <laughs> yeah. In Mark Zuckerberg's garden. In Mark Zuckerberg's garden. Yeah. I'm betting on you, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, we all are. I'm betting on malaria to be the real yeah. one. <laughs> that might beat us. If he gets infected, you know, that might beat me too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've seen how you deal with someone who's in the in the grips of gastrointestinal distress, Robert. I think you could. You could <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because Robert and I have had some times. But yeah. You should have bought that second charm, James. Yeah, I should have done, man. I didn't have enough meteorites on me that day. <laughs> As a result. Yeah. One of the worst days of my life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> For those who are not familiar, oh, Robert man. and I went on a reporting trip to Thailand yeah. to cover the and, civil war. And after, in after like two weeks, I was like, you know what? I'm going to get us a nice night at a, a very nice hotel, La Meridian in Bangkok. You know, we'll have like a little bit of luxury on our way out. James gets sick on the way in and just hurls in the parking lot of one of the nicest hotels in Bangkok. <laughs> and you both, you both were separately messaging me about it uh, and Let's it was just so say, funny. The tone, the tone was. T- it was like James, like James is like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna die. And Robert's like, he fucking did it. He made it. It was it, he did the nicest hotel. I'm so proud of him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was beautiful. Off in a Nalgene, waiting for them to give us our room. Mm-hmm. It was so funny. I got to I'll give it up to them, you know. The La Meridian staff must <laughs> yeah. have seen some shit cuz they didn't not a not, not didn't an blink. Was <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, and then I think the best part of this was that Robert had thought we got a suite with two rooms. In fact, in mm-hmm. fact, it was one big room with a frosted glass bathroom so he got to watch my shadow hurling. For hours. That's karma for you time. being I had a good so time. obnoxious. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, shout out to the old lady who gave me a shopping bag because I yeah. filled up all the vomit bags in the plane. <laughs> on the flight. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. what a G! Christ, yeah. Yeah. the things we do for journalism. The things yeah. we do for journalism. Anyway, like and subscribe. Yeah, you can go to Cooler Zone Media <laughs> to get this without ads. You can buy my book After the Revolution. It's wherever books are, or you can get it free at a library, or you can find it free at uh, atrbook.com uh, whatever live your life motherfuckers
Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.